Evening, dear friends. Uh, welcome on this Thursday uh, Easter week to the Daniel Berrigan Collective Webinar with uh, Ruby Sales on the politics of resur uh, resurrection. My name is Bill Wiley Kellerman. I'm a member of the collective, which was founded to promote the person, thought, and activist le legacy of Daniel Berrigan. Uh, and which follows the tradition that he promoted in which contemplation, uh, reflection, and study flow into and from community, nonviolence, and resistance. And we seek to create uh, spaces for dialogue between Dan's writing and contemporary communities of resistance, and hence this conversation with uh, Ruby Sales, whom I'll introduced shortly. Uh, we want to begin with a prayerful little reflection offered by Anna, a member of uh, Collective's uh, Coordinating Committee. Um, I actually didn't ask you about that, Anna. Are you ready to go on that? Say it again, Bill. Are you doing a reflection? Yes, I am. Yes, yes. Yeah, ready to go. Yep. <clears throat> so for the a prayer to start our meeting tonight. I chose to read, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a rendering of Psalm 133 by Daniel Berrigan, hand in hand, heart in heart. Sisters and brothers dwell in peace. What joy, what an omen. Hand in hand, heart in heart, a double strength a waterfall pausing, various, ever moving, roses, surprising strawberries, a closed circle, an enclosed garden, a universe. There, war's hoarse throat is silenced and praise goes up night and day. And the sanction of souls in the hills gather dust, Bring Ivy. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just a word on uh, how we're going to proceed. I'm going to begin with some uh, introductions, and then we'll have a presentation that Ruby has prepared, and a little bit of silence before entering into a, a conversation. So let me begin with a, an introduction of. Uh, Ruby Sales. And forgive me if I make this a little less formal and, and more personal. I first met Ruby in the 1980s at uh, a Word and World, a people's school event in, in Philadelphia, where she preached a really powerful sermon inviting us to step into the river of movement and history, joining ancestors upstream and the new generation and generations to come down. Uh, at the time, I knew of her history as a, as a young member of, of SNCC and the voter registration organizing in Lowndes County, Alabama, where in the summer of 65, she was part of a group that was held in the Hainville County uh, Ainville Jail, and among the group was uh, Jonathan Daniels, an Episcopal Divinity School student uh, who was part of the organizing work. And almost immediately after their sudden release, he was uh, gunned down right before her by a deputized resident in she herself uh, subsequently attended Episcopal Divinity School herself as a, an Absalom Jones scholar. And, and upon graduation founded the Spirit House Project, which has been the base of her work uh, since then, focused especially on racial justice. She's much attended and honored as a social analyst, a, theologian, writer, and preacher, one of the founders of SAGE 
magazine, a scholarly journal on black women. And just for example, she was a keynote speaker at a gathering of nationally renowned theologians to discuss, to discuss uh, public theology reimagined, uh, hosted by and later broadcast on NPR's On Being with Krista Tippett. And additionally, most recently, she's subject in Sam Pollard's um, newly released film, Lowndes County, The Road to Black Power. I could read uh, an impressive list of citations and engagements, but I think it's even more important to say, at least in my way of thinking, that she's a movement elder to so many, and she's really mentoring a, a new generation of organizers and, and justice seekers. Uh, my last time with her was before the pandemic when she summoned a group of white men, mostly younger, uh, where she guided us uh, in the question of how white supremacy was less a privilege than a corrosive assault on our souls, uh, not only conforming us to a, a deadly culture, but really deforming us. And uh, it was issuing a call to vulnerability and healing, not unlike, uh, I think, what we'll uh, hear from her in, in this evening on resurrection and uh, technocracy. And for that, uh, and for her presence this evening, I'm in the debt and say thank you, Ruby Sales, and welcome. I also want to introduce Cheryl Blankenship, who uh, after we listen to a gospel music intro, Come Ye Disconsolate, by, sung by uh, Roberta Flack and Danny, Donny Hathaway, uh, Cheryl will read remarks that Ruby has prepared. Cheryl Blankenship uh, is partner and co-director with Ruby in the work of the Spirit House Project. She's the one who manages the day-to-day -day programmatic activities, fiscal activities, uh, supervising staff and volunteers. And she also has an impressive history of administrative work in higher education and in government, uh, for example, with AmeriCorps. And we're so grateful that she can join us this evening. After the sung word uh, and uh, the presentation, red presentation, we'll take a brief period of silence and deep, lift, uh, deep listening. Welcome to you as well, Cheryl. Um, I think I'm going to play this. Let me know if the quality is not good.
Good evening, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you for the invitation to join you. And thank you, Bill, for the introduction. Uh, one thing I want to add to it was that uh, at the time that um, Jonathan Daniels was killed in 1965 in Hainville, Alabama, a Catholic priest, Father Richard Morris Rowe, was also shot in the back and um, wounded. He has, I guess, still a bullet lodged in his back. He's um, you know, he, he walks with a limp, um, but that's quite a situation that occurred there as they were being released from the jail in Hainville, Alabama at the time there. It's documented in many um, books, et cetera. You can read the story. Ruby has asked me to read her reflection to you this evening. It's entitled, A Bomb in Gilead. And it represents the deep dive that she's been doing about technocracy and its spiritual and social implications in the world today. Um, please read along. I believe you have it available. You're welcome to do that. And as Bill mentioned, if we could take uh, brief reflection time after I've done uh, before we move on to the facilitated discussion with her and Bill and Anna and whomever else. Thank you so much. Anyway, a bomb in Gilead. Listen to the lambs, all are crying. Listen to the lambs, all are crying. This is from an African-American spiritual. Quote, the recent dominance of the West is now firmly in decline and a new universal world order is in the making. This is also an order with a tangible sense of the extreme harm that we are doing to our environment. We build mega cities of pollution in the middle of deserts. We cut down large swaths of forest all around the world, destroying both wildlife and the air we breathe. We elect leaders full of self pride and little concern for global humanity. We fail to prepare ourselves adequately for a world in which a long line of anticipated catastrophes and disasters and the precipice is lining up for us. We tip endless muck into the oceans and rivers so life cannot survive. We turn all of human sensitivity and life into a deluge of digital dehumanization. And wherever we look, if we do look, we can see a morass of inequality, the rich and their unqualified greediness doing so much more damage than the poor, who are forced to suffer so much. The deep structural divides over men and women, different ethnicities and sexualities and more are embedded in deep levels of violence and unbearable suffering stalks the world in many places." End quote. This is by Ken Plummer, Plummer from Critical Humanism, a 21st century manifesto. Sojourners, how many of you feel unsteady in your soul from loneliness and low-grade depression and suffering which you privatize and hold tightly and secretly? Do you pretend that life is great and amazing despite feeling low levels of depression, loneliness, unsteadiness, and growing feelings of irrelevance? Do you long for a community of reaffirmation and intimacy where you can talk openly and honestly without being judged or indicted in a society of winners or losers. 
Do you feel as if you are caught up in a mighty speed ball where changes are happening so fast you can't keep up with them? You are absolutely right. Something is happening in the world that is changing the nature of what it means to be human. This question is a socio-spiritual one that requires us to look deeply at the world around us and our place in it. Despite the promises of technology and despite the ways that it makes our lives seem easier, it intensifies the violence and systemic blows that separate us from God, each other, and all aspects of creation. Often, we engage in horizontal hostility towards each other instead of reflecting on the socio-spiritual causes and sites of systemic and spiritual wounds. To turn around in another direction is not easy, especially today in a global world where we are in the midst of a socio-spiritual, biological, economic changes and challenges, which according to uh, Klaus Schwab, are fundamentally revolutionizing the way we live, work, and relate to one another. In its scale, the fourth industrial revolution is unlike anything humankind has experienced before, disrupting fundamentally, altering the ways that we live, work, and relate to one another. These changes are so profound, fast moving, expansive, and new that they disrupt and unsettle almost all of our values, rituals, ethics, and theologies. Schwab locates the magnitude of these changes and disruptions within a fourth industrial revolution. This revolution has the potential to improve every aspect of our lives in areas of government, healthcare, education, and the environment, including the climate. However, instead of bringing relief to communities around the globe, people of God are crying out for comfort. They hunger for righteous and hopeful news. Many of God's lambs, who are also members of your communities, feel hopeless, powerless, and spiritually exhausted in the face of so much contention, brokenness, and suffering. We all, each of us, desperately search for signs and sites of hope and meaning in a time of socio-spiritual crises in rural and urban sites of desolation and human disposability. In a socio-political culture, fraught with calamities which often appear beyond our control and which seem greater than our capacity to fix, we urgently need safe spaces where we can work together to figure out what to say to each other and how to say it. These socio-spiritual malformations impact many dimensions and degrade the vitality of our lives as well as our relationships with God, each other and all aspects of creation. They must shape the nature of Christian theology in a global world where in 2017, 1% of the white men control more than 50% of global wealth, and the top 30% control more than 95% of global wealth, while 70% of us had to split the remaining 5%. These statistics paint a dire picture at home and abroad of unprecedented hunger and poverty. According to statistics from Feeding America in 2017, 34 million people in the US face poverty and before COVID, 37 million Americans were chronically hungry. 10 million were children. COVID-19 has intensified hunger and poverty. It has left millions of families without a dependable income and more than 54 million Americans experience food insecurity. As was the case during Jesus' time, 
The economic disparity between the rich and the poor is staggering. Additionally, gentrification continues to move economically dispossessed communities out of cities into rural sites of desolation and isolation without access to food, clean water, hospitals, transportation, and jobs. Millennials occupy the unique position of being the firstborn inheritors of a digitized global world where the shroud of death hangs on every doorpost. Although the unique position of millennials affords them benefits that were unimaginable to their parents and grandparents, they bear the weight of the socio-spiritual malformations and social perversity of a death-driven technological industrial complex. Millennials are the inheritors of a world that exacerbates discrimination, promotes hate speech, inundates their lives with displays of public violence, decimates their critical analytical skills as well as creativity, promotes alienation and fragmentation, and minimizes their significance in a project to advance social justice. Although millennials share much in common, this nation's racist past still hangs over their lives and the life and culture of the nation. The growing demographic shifts in this country that trend towards people of color have accelerated racist systemic assaults on communities of color affecting their access to quality education, healthcare, jobs, and being partners in a participatory democracy. COVID-19 has exacerbated these systemic fault lines. At the same time, this is not the whole story. The good news is that millennials are a powerful demographic generation. They possess the wherewithal to shift the center of gravity of a death-driven technological industrial complex where very few lives matter and black, brown, and indigenous lives matter least of all. Millennials comprise more than 75 million of the American population and are the largest post-war generation. They make up 30% of the voters now and are 40% of eligible voters. They are also the most diverse generation. Moreover, as a group, they are driven by a deep impulse to do justice and to improve the quality of life for everyone. As elders and spiritual guides, we are tasked with engaging them in process of socio-spiritual community formation that build on these strengths to give them the insight and foresight that they need to deal with the interlocking systemic injustices. In my conversations with millennials age 35 and younger, they speak the universal language of alienation, loneliness, and a nagging hopelessness. Many of them question the staying power of faith and God in a digitized era where they are shut up in virtual spaces where reality is reproduced rather than experienced and engaged in the wonders of the world around us. Consequently, elders are tasked with strengthening millennials' capacity for survival by building a beloved community that is rich with a social gospel of pragmatic optimism. In short, we must begin to heal the intergenerational divide which is a wellspring for spiritual genocide. Daniel Berrigan in his reflection and ethic of resurrection proposes that the answers to this question, these questions call on us to reflect on the quote, implications of no in a virtue of a larger yes 
that we undertake an ethic of resurrection and live according to the slight edge of life over death, end quote. Both Berrigan and Plummer underscore Jesus's reminder to Nicodemus that in order to offset the deadly consequences and scars of empirism, we must have a resurrection of the spirit which gives new and unblemished substance and vitality to our lives with God and each other. Instead of becoming warriors of destruction, we must become peacemakers and reconcilers who live in harmony with the earth and all that is in it. Our brother Berrigan's beautifully poetic theology and Jesusology provides us with the eye wash to cleanse our eyes of the socio-spiritual debris. The debris clouds our vision and interferes with our ability to clearly see the systemic hands among us whose power predicates itself on dehumanization, fragmentation, vilification, criminalization, commodification, and physical annihilation, all of which are single and collective acts of premeditated murder by those white worshipers of death in a culture of crucifixion and non-redemption. I can't promise you that we will quickly and easily solve all the issues or understand the complexity of the problems or identify all of the hope zones. However, I can promise you that if we burrow deeply into the systemic and collective harms of injustices, we will move on a pathway towards recapitulation, reparations, redemption, reconciliation, resurrection, and restoration, which Jesus hollowed out. Our knowledge gained in the 20th century teaches us that we must speak in tongues about the human condition. At the same time, I am deeply aware of how difficult it is to speak in tongues without losing our particular lives or our unique somebodiness. Yet, we must, if we are to become whole, and relational human beings who embody our multidimensional selves. To paraphrase Ken Plummer, we must develop 21st century manifestos of critical humanism and theological reflections and spiritual practices that offer pathways toward formulations of intersectional perspectives and relationships. Both of these are open projects rather than closed theories. They are ever-changing endeavors to remake and rethink a narrative that leads us towards building a beloved community in the 21st century where the world house is on fire. Despite what appears to be overwhelmingly bad news, there is good and hopeful news. We are not entrapped in bad history. Because of God's grace and mercy, we have in the words of my black ancestors, the power to rise up holy and sanctified when we rise. Thanks be to God for the power of resurrection. Amen.
Amen. Amen. I invite you back to a space of uh, conversation uh, and reflection. Ruby really is, uh, indicates she desires uh, as much uh, back and forth. Uh, Conversation as we can manage on Zoom, as well as uh, as well as questions, uh, and I'll do my best to to moderate. Uh, I think if you raise your hand, we're not going to use the chat for questions as often as done in this case, but uh, simply raise your hand, and I'll um, I'll call on you. Um, I thought I might put a first uh, comment and, and question. Uh, I was fortunate to have uh, uh, Ruby's talk in front of me. So uh, I was really, I was struck uh, by the by a, a word, socio-spiritual, uh, which functions as kind of a modifier or a most of force in, in her, her remarks. Um, it's not a term that I've seen before, but it's, it's very concisely uh, put, and I, I think I get it uh, intuitively, um, and it fits with my, my own understanding of things. Um, you used it at the beginning uh, to describe uh, sort of the world forces that are altering what it means to be human and uh, a socio-spiritual force of malformation uh, made by the technological industrial project. Uh, and I think similarly back to what I was saying about our, our DC gathering on likeness. Uh, but, and, and it comes up repeatedly, uh, but you also use it uh, with respect to elders and guides who point the way to socio-spiritual uh, community movement formation. And it seems to me like a pivotal term that's carrying a lot of uh, weight and is really sort of the basic uh, you know, compacts the basic thesis that uh, these structures, social structures that we're facing and struggling with and that are shaping our, our lives uh, uh, have, a, have a structural dimension, but also uh, a spiritual one. That, that those are sort of one and the same. So that uh, their impact is on our own souls and spirits, if I get what, uh, what you're saying. Uh, but also, uh, the, you know, the flip side of that, even with respect to resurrection, is that uh, uh, socio-spiritual practices and uh, work, <laughs> Um, are, are, are really part of the essential 
tactics of uh, not only changing ourselves, but uh, confronting and, and changing the realities of, you know, that we're faced with. So anyway, I, I just wonder if, if you might uh, open up the, up the term a little, a little more for us. I don't know if it's, if it's a term of your own making or it's, it's more common and I just don't know it. Uh, but I'd be I'd be glad for uh, hear a little more on, on that. Well, thank you so much, Bill. And I'd like to echo Cheryl's thank you for each of you coming out to 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 engage in this conversation as we began to really look at the social political landscape that we live in today. And Bill. In the West, as you know, there's a disconnect between our inner lives and, and, and our outer world. And so basically what I'm saying is that who we are on the inside determines the social world that we build on the outside. And that part of what we have to do is to heal that brokenness where we believe that we can think one thing and do another, that there's no connection between who our beliefs and how we move in the world. And so what I'm saying is that there is a connection between our spiritual world and our social world. Excuse me, my throat. And so with accelerate technology or technocracy accelerates individualism and totally decimates our collective and communal selves. And so that's another reason why I want us to really look at the connection between our consciousness, our mindfulness, and who we are in the world. We tend to think of Christianity as an abstraction. But Christianity really is a movement of consciousness. It seeks to change who we are in the inside, change our spirit. It's a spiritual movement that changes our relationship to each other, God, and all aspects of creation. So that's why I use it there. Because I think that part of what happens in the West, in particular in America, is that we are reduced to one identity, skin. And all of our other identities are murdered. And so we are constantly targeted only. So that we can talk about our skin color. You're white, I'm black, nothing more, nothing less. Well, that's not true. I'm more than that. I'm more than my skin. And so these are the issues that we must grapple with in a technocracy. Another thing that I think is very important is that even when we think we're being radical, if we're not careful, we're recreating the very world that we are protesting. And, you, and the reason why is that you have to have a change of consciousness. You cannot do this work unless you've been born again. And so that's why I feel I stress that. I just like to ask people, was that too much to take in in one setting? And if not, what did you get out of it? I'd like to hear your thoughts about the reflection. Hello. Hi. I probably look a little dark in here, <laughs> but um, I I sat up and lit up <laughs> when I heard you speak of us being reduced to one identity. And, um, and the other thing that went with that was that you were more than black. But what I think I have more than one identity, but being black, I'm proud of that. I don't wanna be anything else. And when we're reduced to one identity, even though we're subdued or not treated as well, 
the identity we are subdued to is that of the white culture, white supremacy. I think what I'm really saying, you're right. What I'm really saying is that when we are just reduced to our skin color, for example, there are many black peoples in the world. And so when you reduce us to one monolith called black people, you erase our particular experience. I, as a black woman born in the South during segregation, have a very different experience than a black woman who's come to this country from Jamaica or a northern black woman who grew up in New York. And so when we reduce each other to one identity, we not only erase our relationship with each other and our ancestors, but we also erase our history with God. I completely understand what you're saying. And, um, you know, uh, last, what is this, April? So it's time is flying. <laughs> In February, I was on a civil rights pilgrimage with a group um, that initiated from North Carolina, but we went to Alabama and uh, we visited um, Selma, we visited Montgomery, and we visited. I'm forgetting the, the place where the children and the dogs were. I'm forgetting the Montgomery. Yes, mm -hmm. Montgomery. Birmingham. 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 Okay, Birmingham. So we went to Birmingham, Montgomery, and Selma. And um, and what I learned from that, I'm I am from Washington D.C., so I was not deeper south. And um, though I had an experience of race and was very conscious of civ the civil rights movement and such things as that, I grew up in it. It's what I grew up in, among other things, the Bay of Pigs and a whole lot of other things. Um, but when I went to Selma and I heard people around my age now talking about what they had to go through like crossing the Selma Bridge when they were nine or 12 years old. Um, some people still suffering injuries from that and um, still seeing so, somewhat in the atmosphere, um, the separation of peoples. And also when I was there, um, it was just after one of the uh, tornadoes that had gone through Alabama and I saw the devastation. I mean, it was like bomb, somebody bombed the area. And it was the area where mostly black people were. So um, I don't think tornadoes have any discrimination <laughs> against yeah. land or peoples yeah. or anything like that. But I think we have the ability to discriminate against people and put them in the areas that keep the other people out of less danger. Well, the thing about it is that you can't do an offense to keep other people out without keeping your own self out. And so offenses not only keep black people or brown people out, it also can confine the world of white people. And so what the, what the power structure does is that it promises white people the world and gives them the songs of containing that. And they, and they say that's a privilege to be contained. And they're white people are as much contained as we are. We yeah, really they're being fight. deceived. <laughs> yes. Well, no, we all are being deceived. In many yeah, ways. But, but I'm agreeing with you that it's not just black people that are being deceived. That no. white people, that the majority of white people with that just have jobs and ways of living and even may have some um, ability to have more than maybe some poor people or whatever, they're still being deceived in that they are being treated with privilege when the real privilege is only among the 1%. I, I think what I'm saying in, in the piece I did tonight is that I'm calling on us to, to create a social gospel in the 21st century that deals with the compelling reality that we live in a capitalist technocracy where very few lives matter and black and brown lives matter least of all lives. And that, and that we began to look at the ways in which that, the common ground that we stand on 
as well as our particular grounds that we stand on. And that we, we I mean, you mentioned um, the, the, what Black people endured in Selma, but that should not have been a surprise because look at what this country has been engaged in a project of genocide, violence from the very inception uh, when it uh, committed those acts against Native American people. Yes, that's true. But at the same time, we must also look at the ways in which we are complicit in stoking the existence of the system. That we that no one's hands are clean in this matter. That we've got to not only look out at the world, but it's also important to look at the ways in which we facilitate oppression and our own suicide. I don't disagree with anything you just said. <laughs> I don't. I don't. And and I don't think um, I was surprised by what I saw. But for me, it was further evidence um, because I care about us. You know, I'm not saying I don't care about other people as well, but I care about us because we are among, as Jesus would say, the least of these. Um, and when it comes to considering what we can do to help people, we fall to the end of the, of the, the yes, struggle. I want to challenge the least of these. We might be least in, in terms of the system, in terms of power, but in the eyes of God, we are not the least of the significant. So oh, I, I, I yes, I, 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 I don't mean. think we're- Let me finish, please. That's okay. I mean, I say that we have to speak in tongues. Because mm -hmm. we call black people and brown people marginalized, as if that's our ultimate absolute description. And so that means that the minute you say that, that means that you're speaking in an empire tongue. Uh, we might be marginalized in the system, but we are significant in God's creation in the eyes of God. And so we got to be really careful about how women might be insignificant to, to, to a patriarchy. But in the eyes of God, we're significant. And so we've got to begin to, to rethink how we speak. But our speech is, is as dangerous sometimes as our actions. And our speech also serves to minimize our lives while aggrandizing the lives of the ruling class. Yeah, I'm seeing hand Dorothy's up. hand up in, uh, uh, in the corner. Uh, Thanks, uh, Teresa, for that uh, exchange and the thoroughness of it. Uh, Dorothy? Yeah. Yes. yes, thank you. Um, I was, I think I was very struck by that term socio-spiritual spaces. Um, and I think that um, Ruby's description of the inside outside was very helpful, but, but I was thinking of you know, I, I'm in New York, in East Harlem, I'm involved with a lot of um, different, um, you know, people there and agencies. And, you know, how you can um, develop spaces where we can figure out what to say to each other and how to say it. I think that was very profound, Ruby. And I think that those spaces are, um, what we're partly of what we're called to to be able to have these kinds of conversations from from the inside out and and from the heart and and I just thank you for that idea because it's it's a helpful way of conceptualizing how to have um, you know to develop community or to develop how to have people come together so thank you Thank you, and I also want to say that that's very important in a virtual world where intimacy is totally being shifted and that we've got to come, we've got to figure out how is it that we need to come to know each other? How is it that we rebuild community in a world of artificial intelligence and platformization in a world where history is no longer lived, it's, it's manufactured. It's, it's not our experiences with each other anymore. It's, 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 it's conveyed through platforms and, and chat box, technology. Yes. 
Yes, I see you right here. Um, Jordan. Joanne. You know, I, I would just like to go back, Miss Sales, to your original question where you said, did I give too much information tonight? And I just want to say to you that I think you gave a very clear and decisive description of where we are today in this world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other hands? I just want to say something about speech. I know that we've been told that the movement in the South was a civil rights movement, but it was more than that because once you say civil rights, you make it a transactional movement and you eradicate God and, and so forth out of that. And so the Southern Freedom Movement, it was not just a civil rights movement, revisionist history, we had freedom songs, we lived in freedom houses, we had freedom summer, and we were freedom fighters. And so we saw ourselves not as civil rights workers. Because when you just say civil rights, you take the hands, the power out of the hands of the people and place it in the hands of the of politicians. And also you just destroy and negate the soul force. It was not civil rights that enabled black folks to set up the gun. It was not civil rights that enabled young black children to stand up their horses and, and German shepherd dogs. It was not civil rights that allowed, that enabled black people to go to jail and to face all kind of terror. It was our spiritual soul force. It was our, it was our movement spirit where we no longer feared death. Because it, and that's why I say it was a spiritual movement, but a whole let us say the death system. That we no longer gave the empire the power to hold the instrument of death over our heads. That we had moved up a little higher. And that we saw death very differently. And that we, we understood that nothing, not even death, could separate us from the love of God. That's right. And that was a movement of consciousness. It was not a civil rights movement. I mean, civil rights was a part of it, but it's not the whole story. May I briefly put in a plug about um, a movie that was just released, produced in 2002 and released last month called Lowndes County, The Road to Black Power. And this was done by Sam Pollard. It was on MSNBC um, about two weeks ago, but it is streaming now on Amazon and um, Peacock on your television. In it, um, it is about Black people from Lowndes County, Alabama. It goes into this situation with Ruby and Jonathan Daniels, but it shows the community of Black people and how they were the largest majority of individuals within the county and their quest for voting rights and the freedom movement. I think it captures what Ruby was describing, the soul force more clearly than um, what she or other things you might see about it today. So Lowndes County, the road to black power is streaming on Amazon and Peacock. If you have an opportunity, please take a look at that movie. And Ruby is in it and has some very poignant statements. The thing that I wanna also say about it is that the minute you say civil rights, you dehistoricize it, the meaning of that movement. We separated from Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass. We separated from a long line of Black people struggling in this country for freedom. And that, and that, 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 and so that the first freedom movement in this country 
that was organized by ordinary enslaved black people was the was the runaway enslaved movement, where people organized a movement where black people could escape from enslavement and go to free territory in this country. And so black folks have always been struggling for freedom in this country, not just civil rights, because when you say civil rights, mm. you hide the lynchings, you hide the, the religious aspect, you hide the black church convention movement, you hide all of that. And you and you reduce it to a struggle for for, for voting rights or or, or or lunch counting. But we were in it for more than a hamburger. We were in it for, as Martin Luther King said, to, to redeem the soul of America. It was a movement of redemption and reconciliation. Hmm. Excuse me, Miss Sales, it was never my intention to offend you by using the word civil rights. I grew up through the civil rights movement. I me. know about Jim Crow. I know about um, what happened after emancipation. Um, when, um, you know, wait, first of all, you didn't offend me, but I feel like that's a common mistake that we make in talking about the movement. So I think it might be common to you, but for me, when I say civil rights, I'm not disconnecting. I just wrote a book about Harriet Tubman, by the way. I'm not disconnecting anybody. <laughs> from what happens i'm We're simply talking, talking about, about when i went to, when i went on a civil rights pilgrimage that's what it was called yes, I, I managed I'm to see how that. people i'm sorry what i'm saying please try to hear what i'm saying i'm trying okay. to say the people like myself who were in that movement we were dealing with freedom we we're not dealing with the narrowness of civil rights i hear you but i'm just saying that the language is very very important because it, it, it connects that movement up with a long history of Black struggle in this country. And that's all I'm saying. I'm not indicting you or I'm not <laughs> criticizing you, but I'm just trying to encourage us to really think deeper and larger about the meaning of language. I remember what I saw, I heard, I was in an organizing group and I heard a, um, uh, you were on um, that the, um, podcast with, uh, I'm forgetting her name now, I'm forgetting the name of the podcast right now. But at the end of the podcast, she usually has one line that from someone, she was interviewing you, and there's one line at the end um, that she repeats after when the um, podcast is about to end. And you said that um, in the civil rights movement, that we ended up giving our children to those who did not love them. So I kind of understand what you're saying about when you put one movement or one action into uh, the center of everything that has happened. But I just wanted to assure you that I don't do that to myself mentally. Why are you taking I, it personally? Why are you taking it? Because you, because uh, you, because when I was we trying to share this. with you, this is not fair to everybody who's here. That's okay. You and I All right. Have this conversation. We can have it on the telephone. I'll give you my phone number. But I don't think it's fair for us to get uh, in a knot about something that does not even that I'm not even saying it's not even relevant to the conversation. Because I didn't indict you. I'm talking by the way. It's like I know that that there. That, I'll give you an example. It's very hard to change how we use language. I know that people are more than skin, but yet I say black because I've been so socialized into using that language and that it's very hard to say African-American or Jamaican-American or Irish-American. It's so hard to, to untangle people from a monolith because we've been so programmed. So when I say black, I, I'm very conscious that I'm committed uh, a violation against the very speech that I'm encouraging us to do, but I also say, look, I'm human. And we all, we all are, as, as Ryan Hole Niebuhr said, we're all, we're not above culture. And so that we're not trying to be perfect. What we're trying to do is to, to try to be, to trust each other enough to be vulnerable. And to be, and not to, the purpose of a movement is not to see the bad in people. But a movement 
uh, recognizes the good in people that they don't see in themselves and that it calls them to that goodness. Mm. And so movements are, movements are predicated on hope. They're predicated on the assumption that we can all change. And it gives each of us the benefit of the doubt. And it writes no one's obituary until, the, until they are dead. The movements are about transformation and hope. I'm seeing a couple of hands, uh, and I'm going to go to, I think, parents. Harry Moran was up first there. Uh, many things that you said, Ruby, struck me, uh, particularly kind of naming uh, the low-grade depression uh, that uh, so many of us feel like we're in or experience. Um, and I just, I just found it very helpful to hear you name that because uh, often we tend, I think, to blame ourselves yeah, that uh, I should be more resilient or I shouldn't let this stuff bother me. Whereas, uh, as you said, the socio-spiritual space that empire wants to put us in um, uh, causes this uh, low-grade depression. Uh, so um, again, I appreciate you naming that. The other phrase I really loved was uh, you talked about Dan Berrigan's writing and person, I think, as being eyewash. And uh, I thought that's a great expression. And uh, how much each of us needs to uh, continually do that eyewashing. Because the, um, the bleak um, socio-spiritual space of empire um, is just so, so deep. Um, and so pervasive that unless you're consciously resisting, unless I'm constantly washing my eyes with something, uh, it's, it's going to um, impede my ability to see uh, and to see resurrection. So I mm. wonder, um, I don't know, did you know Dan or could you say a little bit more about how uh, uh, you experience him as I do as an, uh, a healthy eye wash? Well, I, I didn't know him personally. I certainly knew of his work and what he had done. And I certainly think that some of that his writings call us to a higher level of consciousness and calls us to come and see the world through not only the world, but also ourselves within the world. Thanks. Anna Brown. I mean, what do you think about the notion that resurrection is not an event, but it's an everyday process? Say that again, Ruby. That resurrection is not an event, it's an everyday process. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Dan was always saying, you know, risk resurrection. Uh, and you do that not by believing in something that happened 2,000 years ago, but what, what, by what you, the choices you choose to make every day. Um, and resurrection is a risk. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's something every day. And do you see it as a sacrifice or a gift? Is resurrection a sacrifice or a gift in your estimation? Uh, an incredible gift. Why? Well, speak a little bit more about that. Um, well, I mean, uh, I, I just went for that because sacrifice uh, seems so uh, grim. Uh, but uh, just just the, the idea that uh, death... Uh, doesn't have the last word. Hmm. Uh, and that um, also with resurrection, you know, one of the characteristics of it was is that nobody recognized the risen Jesus. Uh, their, their dearest hope was right under their nose and nobody saw it. Um, and that's a powerful reminder to me that uh, there's an energy in the universe. My dearest hope is already a gift to me. And I've got to open my eyes and move myself uh, to, to act according to it. Um, so I see it in a gift that way. 
Can I make a case for uh, event as well as uh, I, I want to kind of I kind of want to hold them together as uh, that blue? yes okay, yeah yes. I want to I I want to hold them together almost like quantum physics you know it's a wave and a, a particle um, I do think uh, resurrection is is something on the eyewash topic that we're always looking to discern in history and community. And it, it's, it happens, you know, you sort of glimpse it. It's, uh, it happens here and there now and then. And, and part of the spiritual discipline that we, of discernment that, uh, that we undertake with our eyes wide open is, is to recognize it and see it in moments that it happens. And at the same time, it's a, it's a practice itself. And it's, a, it's an everyday, uh, as you called it, a dynamic uh, process. Um, I would say, and in, in you were asking about, you know, is it, does it involve suffering? I think it involves, I think resurrection involves the, the freedom to, to face consequences that can be very hard, uh, but I don't think that's like a prerequisite or something, you know? That makes sense? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. I was thinking about the fact that baptism is one of the uh, yeah. steps towards resurrection. Mm -hmm. The crossing over into a new life is also a kind of resurrection. Mm. Yep. And then when we cross over, then when Jesus is baptized, now don't forget that he then goes into the wilderness. And he knows that in order to, to move forward in the direction that he feels called to, is that he's got to erase those that social spiritual hubris the appetites that would imp impede his ability to, to carry out his mission. And all of mm. he went through that process, as Black folk would say, tell me, how did you feel when you come out the wilderness? Mm. I felt brand new and my heart did too when mm. I come out the wilderness. But when, when Jesus came out of the wilderness, it was at the end of his resurrection because then he, he he then he had these experiences along the way, the woman with the flow of blood, the Syrophoenician woman, the, the conversation with Nicodemus. So Jesus himself was in process, always moving mm. towards, towards the yeah. path. Yes. Wanna want to welcome Anna uh, back in and oh. she's got her hand up there. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Ruby. <laughs> Um, I, I agree with um, an earlier commentator who uh, said that the clarity of your talk, the power of your talk uh, was such a gift. And I'm so deeply appreciative uh, for all that you shared with us tonight. Uh, I guess um, I, I wanna say many things, but maybe the first thing um, you started by asking us to listen to the land yes. and that, resonated with me because uh, I'm, I'm here in uh, New Jersey, in Jersey City, and it was 90 degrees today. And the, that listening to the land put, I just felt so afraid. I, I felt um, scared of what I was feeling because, uh, you know, it's, it's only April and it's 90 degrees. And I, I just felt that I was feeling, you know, some of what you were talking about in terms of climate, catastrophic climate change. And then it was interesting, I was gonna ask you about that, but then as I was listening to your responses to some questions tonight, I was so moved by uh, the creation of safe spaces and how you spoke about that and in song, in, in houses, in Freedom Summer. And I was also very moved by when you spoke about, you know, to not dehistor dehistoricize, to see our ancestors 
and the way that they moved. And in some ways that spoke to my fear that said, okay, look at it, but create those spaces and look at the long line of ancestors that has, that has done the work. Um, and, and we continue to do that work uh, in, in the many areas that you spoke of tonight. So that was one comment. The second one was uh, when you spoke about being shut up in a virtual world. Wow, mm -hmm. that really, uh, and one way I think about that is I'm a teacher at a, at a college, St. Peter's University. And when I first started teaching many years ago, I'd walk into the classroom and it was filled with sound. Everybody was talking to each other, it was great. Um, but when I walk into the classroom today, it's totally silent and everybody's on their phone and it lends itself to that loneliness that you were taught. I miss my students. I miss them. Um, and it, it's, uh, it, you know, there is a feeling of loneliness and of alienation. And I try to make an effort to, to go up to each of them and, and, you know, try to talk to them and, and somehow I think they think that's kind of weird because, <laughs> you know, because, <laughs> because, they're, because they're, as you said so well, they're shut up in that virtual world. And I don't know, maybe any comment about that, or I, I wish they, they could listen to you because I, I just felt so uplifted tonight. You know, I, I came in with that fear of what I was feeling today as I was listening to our beautiful land suffering in this tremendous heat. And then I listened to you and I felt so much better. <laughs> Those are my comments, but thank you, Ruby. Thank you. You know, I work with young people, Anna, and one of the things that just really, I didn't understand this until they told me that they live in a prompt culture. They, mm -hmm. have, they live by prompts. Yeah. They get their prompts from the phone. They yep. want, in classes, they want the teacher to give them a prompt to tell them how to think about something. And so we were, what we were witnessing in young people is the death of the creative spirit. And mm -hmm. so that we must begin. I just really worried that we were going too freely into a technocracy without asking the salient questions about what are the implications of what we're doing. That is, and, and, that, and that we live in that we too, freely give all our lives to a surveillance state. Yes. I mean, we really don't think about the, the decimation of privacy. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that for the convenience of, 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 a, of, of, of a benefit, we just hand over everything. We don't look at surveillance and the dangers of surveillance in a society that has a long history of McCarthyism, of, of opening citizens' mail, of, of, of overreaching in people's affairs. I mean, I, I just sometimes I get very, very concerned that somehow we have suspended our critical analysis and we have become lambs that are going to the slaughter Mm -hmm. Without asking the very hard questions that we need to be asking about the social spiritual landscape that we live in today. For example, we don't ask what is the relationship between the COVID, the fact that the people in power knew that COVID killed people and, they, and that vaccinations would help but yet they allow millions of people to die. That is, that is not by accident. That is the same reason why state sanctioned murder of Black people have accelerated in this country. That's the same reason why, why schools are militarized. That's the same reason why people are dying, Black women are dying at the birthing school. It's because very few lives matter and Black and Brown lives matter. So all. What does it mean to live in a society where human labor is becoming less and less relevant in a society of robots, artificial intelligence, 
it's even changed the meaning of it, what an intellectual is now. Mm -hmm. And who produces knowledge now. The whole production of knowledge is basically out of the hands of, 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 of intellectuals and it's in the hands of technocrats. And we're just not paying attention. And, 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 that, and that not only does it change our social world, it also changes our, our religious and spiritual world. Because we will press something and we will call it an icon, we will call it materialization, a little object on a computer, an icon. Only God is an icon. And so in so many ways, we are becoming complicit in our own erasure. How do we talk about what it means to be human in a world of nanotechnology? where men have the power to manipulate the gene pool. What, what, are the, what are the regulations and ethical, bioethical questions that we should be raising in the 21st century about the limits of, of technology? Yes, I, um, I, again, Ruby, thank you. It's so clarifying. And one thing I'm noticing also, and you know, we're reeling in the colleges and universities because you mentioned the word prompt. And what's happening is when students go to write essays, well, uh, they're not really writing them. They, they, they give AI a prompt and then the AI writes right. the essay for them. And I, you know, I think to myself, my God, exactly as you're thinking, why are we erasing ourselves? I want to know what you think. I don't care what, you know, I want the humanness of the essay. I want to see the mistakes so that we can work on them together. So I think it's a race share. And I, I'll say one more thing because I know Ryan wants to speak, but the other phrase that you used that really resonated with me was the phrase spiritual genocide. Uh, Thank you, Ruby. Uh, could you speak to that a bit more? Because that that had a power to it that I want to think about more. But I'd love to hear what you have to say about that, that phrase, spiritual genocide. Yes, when the young is separated from the old, the ability to even pass along a theological history or theologies have been disrupted. And so even Christians do not have the power to reproduce themselves. And that's why we see the Christian, uh, mainline Christian religion dying today because mm -hmm. of the spiritual genocide, because we have not been able to, that there's been such a disruption between the relationship between the young and the old. Mm -hmm. And therefore there is no hindsight. Mm -hmm. And without hindsight, one can't have foresight, I mean, insight. Mm -hmm. And one certainly can't plan a future when you don't have hindsight and insight. Mm -hmm. And so that, and, and it happens even in, in social settings that the United Nations says in Article 4 that one of the, uh, very, one of the aspects of gen, uh, genocide is to separate the young from the old because the culture can't perpetuate itself. Mm -hmm. It's just a disruption in the, in, the, in the continuity of the culture. And so the same thing is so spiritual because our inner, as you see that we, we, are, we are supreme materialists. We believe Anna, that existence, that only what can be seen is, 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 is that, that only the material world is, is a verification of human existence. That, mm. that, that consciousness is not, that does not exist because it can't be seen. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so that when we cut off that, 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 that history, because spirit is history, spirit is memory. How does one perpetuate Christianity without memory? without mm. the story of not only who God has been to you on a private level, but who God has been to you as a people. Mm. Mm -hmm. yes, thank you, Ruby. I'm, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. I'm, I'm watching our time and I know that's my job, but I think we ought to get a, a millennial in here. Ryan, you're up. Ryan, where's Ryan? You're, you're muted, Ryan. 
Hi, Miss Sales. How are you? Thank you. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Bill. I'm I'm not even a millennial. I'm Gen Z. <laughs> <laughs> it's even worse. It's even lower. Um, well, Ms. Sales, actually, Gen Y, Gen Y, Gen Y, and Gen Z are part of the millennial generation. Are they? Oh, okay. Miss yes. um, Sales, you talked about how the Southern Freedom Movement, as you described it, was very much a sustained exercise of community. In, in many sense, that entire movement would not have been possible without that kind of community. And I'm wondering what effect you think technology or technocracy today has on the ability for people to move as a community. That's a very complicated question because I think on the one hand, technology can be very important in announcing what you intend to do. But movements, in a real movement, you you have to trust people, you have to know people, you have to have an eye-to-eye -eye relationship with people. And you can't ask someone to give up their jobs or get put themselves on the line to go to jail if they by some voice on the computer. Because mm. you could be anybody. And so community is first and foremost intimate. It is, a, it is a relationship between the I and the we and the we and the I. And it's, it's hands on, it's eye to eye. It's sharing a history with each other. You can't have a history with each other online. Mm. There's no community there. It's an illusion of community. And it's very dangerous because that illusion will really strip away the significance and the relevancy and the, and, the import, and the necessity of us having eye-to-eye -eye and hands-on relationships with each other. And mm. the problem is if we don't have a community, we not only not know God, each other, but it limits your ability to know God. This is in community and our relationships with each other that we come to know and feel God. So then we end up devoid of a soul force, hmm. a common history that binds us together, a common hands-on history that binds us together. And part of what the, what, what the empire has always done in order to enrich and to maintain its power is to decimate our common connections with each other. So technology has not increased that it has done what it has always done, what the system has always done, it has decimated communities. Well, the communities were decimated because people had to migrate because uh, whether or not they had to immigrate or whether or not they had to flee terror and, and oppression, all those things decimated. It was called dispersion. The system has always rid itself on dispersion. Is scattering in diasporas. So to me, we must figure out a way, if we're going to use technology, we must figure out a way how it might be used in a positive way. But I don't think you can ask them, about, you can't have a movement online. Mm. I am gonna honor our, uh, our time space here. What do you think, Ryan? No, I, I, I'm sorry, I agree. Um, many years ago, Bill Quigley, this is an anecdote, had asked Daniel Berrigan, his lawyer had asked Dan Berrigan who his, his heroes were because Dan was a hero to so many. And reportedly Dan's response to Bill was, I don't believe in heroes, I believe in community. That he, he rejected this idea that there was one person one savior that was coming in and, and fixing things and it was only really done through community but that community was not built online of course because there was no online at that time in you know 68 that community was built through retreats and uh, civil disobedience and protest actions um, that made people intimate not only because they were taking part in the actions together but they spent time in prison together. They spent time in courthouses together. 
right? And so there was an intimacy there as well. Um, so I agree. I, I think that this is why our identities are very important. Once we claim, well, every time we claim a new, uh, uh, another identity towards a wholeness, then we claim another community. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so if we just have one identity, that means that we are then segregated from all of ourselves and all of the communities that are embodied in our multiple selves. And that's the common connection is the multiple cells in the multiple communities of, that are in all of us. And that what, what the empire does is that it separates us from those cells. And in doing that, it segregates us from the community that we are mm. a part of. And it, it makes us, not only separates us, but it also makes us detach ourselves, dismember ourselves. We're no longer members, we're dismembered from the whole. And we become a fraction of who we are. Okay, Trevor wants me to say I'm an African American, one community, I'm a woman, another community, I'm an elderly, I'm a senior, another community. I'm a southerner, so forth and so on. Right. I'm going to gather us up here and uh, say a, a, a really heartfelt word of thanks uh, to Ruby for her bringing her thoughts. Oh, this is so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it was. Thanks for thanks for the. Uh, sort of the liveliness of uh, the conversation that you generate and see. So, and thank you, Cheryl, for, for your help and, uh, and your presence in, with us today. Uh, thanks to Anna on, uh, and Ashe for uh, helping us with uh, the Zoom and uh, Carrie and, and Ryan, also members of the steering committee. I'm not going to make a pitch for uh, donations, but I'm going to I'm going to post the website there. Uh, we kind of run on a, a volunteer, no budget uh, game here. So uh, if you're inclined to put a little into the pot, that's a way to, to do it. Um, and I think that's it. I'm, I'm going to ask Ryan if he would stay on just for a minute and uh, help me on the recording part of this thing. And it's so good to see. So I got, I got tons of friends that I'm looking at, and that's a, that's a gift. Uh, love, to, love, to, love to you and this wide community that is the Berrigan Collective. Thanks to all. Good night. Thank you. It's Joyce Howard. Good night. Goodbye. Hi, Joyce. Thank you. God bless everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Steve and Kim. How is it? Hey Ryan. Yes. At the beginning of this, I'm a I'm a uh, co-chair, whatever it is, host. Yeah. And uh, uh, Anna seemed to have tr be having trouble uh, getting it recorded, so I just hit record. Okay. And I saved it to the cloud, but now I don't know what to do. It's still recording. Right. So when when you exit the call. When you when you sign off, it it should automatically download, take five minutes or so, and save wherever you saved it. That might be the iCloud or that might be your desktop. But it will automatically, when you sign off, convert itself and save. And then, how do I find it? Um, it's if it doesn't pop up on your desktop, you might look if there's an iCloud folder. Um, 
sometimes if you go into your actual Zoom app, like when you open Zoom on the computer, uh -huh. uh, there's a tab that says recorded, and you can go there and, and view recorded meetings that you've been a part of. Um, okay. There's a couple of ways that it might appear, but it will, once the session is ended, it will save itself. Okay, I'll do that. I didn't want to well, wipe no, it out. No. <laughs> yeah, that would not be great. <laughs> All right, thanks for your help. That was, you. your, your questions at the end were great. And, uh, I'm, I'm glad Ruby didn't let me close it down before you got the Bill Quigley story. And, it's a good story, yeah. Yeah, all right, see you soon. See you soon, thank you.